This is an ABC podcast. Half of us think our workplace isn't mentally healthy, and one in five of us have taken time off in the last year because we've been feeling mentally unwell, according to the latest figures from Beyond Blue. But how your family doctor deals with the issue hasn't always been clear. Now, new guidelines for GPs outline how they can help people who've experienced a work-related mental health condition along the path to recovery. One of the authors of these guidelines is Professor Danielle Matzer, Head of the Department of General Practice at Monash University. Danielle, welcome to The Health Report. Great to be here, thanks. So Danielle, what's the scope of this issue? What are the sorts of things that can cause a work-related mental health condition and how many people does it affect? Uh, Well, there's lots of different issues that can arise in the workplace that can influence a person's mental health. Uh, You know, we all... Um, experience uh, different levels of stress in our workplace and work pressure Uh, uh, but sometimes that can be very heightened or there can be harassment or bullying, uh, sometimes uh, sexual harassment Uh, and for others there's exposure to traumatic events, uh, particularly for people who work in the defence forces or in emergency services And all of these kinds of issues uh, can bring about uh, a great deal of mental stress and perhaps a uh, work-related mental health condition. Mm. And it's tricky to work out sometimes whether a mental health condition has been directly caused by something at work or something outside of work or some mix of the two. What factors go into that equation? Yeah, so, you know, f- for people who work, uh, that's that's not all you do in your life and uh, Uh, You know, mental health and well-being uh, comes about from so many different factors uh, and GPs understand this and know their patients well and know also that there might be stuff going on in the family, there may be a previous history of mental illness in that that particular patient Uh, and then there may be new issues arising in the workplace that give rise to Uh, a mental health condition or exacerbate a pre-existing one. And it's sometimes very difficult to tease that all out, particularly uh, when you're first presented uh, with these issues by the patient who may come in in a very distressed state sometimes. Mm. And so what what sort of uh, factors go into teasing that out? Well, uh, we we actually looked at this when we were developing our guideline to see what evidence there was that could support GPs to better understand whether a mental health condition had arisen as a result of work. And there wasn't much evidence in the literature uh, to guide us. So um, we had a wonderful panel uh, who uh, developed this guideline and uh, we made a consensus-based recommendation that really the GP needed to be very comprehensive in their clinical assessment and really consider the factors uh, that were being discussed by the patient, like what pressures were going on, what changes had occurred in the workplace and what the relationship was between these factors and uh, the time of symptom onset and really to try and make an assessment as to whether the condition was consistent with what uh, what was being described. Mm. So it's really about what the patient tells them. And, and how much of this is the work of GPs and how much can other health professionals be involved like psychologists? So I think um, GPs are the first point of call often for these kinds of conditions. Um, and it's the GP's place to really help to uh, make a diagnosis and sort out a management plan. And our guidelines are really focused on being very patient-centred and working with the patient to achieve the best outcomes. And, And in doing so, GPs will often work with various health professionals, whether they be psychologists or psychiatrists or occupational therapists, um, they'll, also, they'll also work with the patient's uh, workplace, uh, um, you know, after there's a discussion with the patient about uh, 
about uh, the condition and the communication that's required and, and with the patient consent, the GP can talk uh, to the workplace and the uh, supervisors and try and get an idea of what's going on. Um, and that will assist the GP in, in making a management plan for that patient. Once the cause or the causes are established, how do you start moving towards recovery? Yeah, so this is a really important point and uh, I think people present quite distressed uh, and, uh, and, the, and the GP, uh, you know, when we've interviewed GPs in the past about these issues, they've, they've voiced a lot of concern, um, found it very difficult uh, knowing what to do, uh, you know, uh, whether to give the patient time off work and how long for and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's very important for the GP to make an accurate diagnosis and assess the severity of the condition. And we've, uh, in our guidelines, suggested um, some very useful evidence-based tools to help GPs do that. Um, and then they need to, to explain the diagnosis, explain the recovery expectations, how long it'll take to, uh, for the condition to improve and what treatments are available and be very patient focused and, uh, and uh, recovery focused uh, uh, in, their, in their explanations and working with the patient to get the best outcome. Isn't it on the employer to sort this sort of thing out? Well, for various reasons, the employer may or may not be aware of what's going on. Uh, I think uh, there are so many different circumstances that can give rise to a mental health condition. Um, and I think uh, that's part of the challenge in working in this area. There are some employers that are very uh, supportive uh, of their employees and uh, want to work uh, to achieve uh, a good outcome. Some are perhaps not aware of what's going on or are inexperienced. A lot of it depends on the size of the workplace too. And I think that uh, um, uh, throughout this process, there needs to be a lot of good communication happening to try and, and, and work things out for the patient. There's a, there's a difficult tension, isn't there, in this situation that work is really good for our health. It, it gives us a sense of identity and, and money and that sort of thing, but it can also be the place that caused that poor mental health in the first place. That's right. So we know that work is good for health. It keeps you connected. Um, uh, it uh, it uh, gives you uh, financial uh, compensation um, uh, and... Uh, 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 it's very it's very important for people's identity, making a contribution, uh, some purpose, meaning, all of those things. So we know work is good for health, but we can't uh, we can't uh, keep people in workplaces uh, where there is uh, uh, ongoing trauma uh, or harassment or bullying. So it's a real it's a real tension here, and you, and you've got to think about this as you would perhaps say. A musculoskeletal injury. You know, if somebody, uh, you know, has a fall at work and hurts their arm or or uh, or their leg and they can't walk or they can't move their arm, you might not necessarily uh, say that they need to stay away from work for a long period of time. You might work with with their employer to see if there were other duties they could perform or other things that they could be doing to keep them connected. And I think we've got to start to think about that in situations uh, where that's possible uh, uh, to, uh, to help people with mental health conditions make a good recovery. Danielle, thanks for joining us on The Health Report. Thank you. Professor Danielle Matzer, Head of General Practice at Monash University in Melbourne.